Thank you very much for inviting me, Evi. And uh, I'm here for the third time already at Combo, and uh, I enjoy it very much. Um, because we are short in time, I will not rush through my talk. I'm telling you immediately. So outline of my talk is going to be uh, overview of drugs that impact bone. But I will just show one slide on this. And then I will talk about risk factors of osteoporosis, osteoporotic fractures. Uh, first of all, and the most important secondary osteoporosis is caused by glucocorticoids. This will be the main topic that I will cover. And then I will talk about aromatase inhibitors that are used as adjuvant treatment in breast cancer uh, patients. And uh, now uh, the guidelines say that these women uh, should take aromatase inhibitor inhibitors as long as 10 years. So they are really at risk for fractures. And then at the end, few slides on androgen deprivation therapy for prostate cancer. Uh, this is a slide showing us all the possible drugs uh, that can interfere with bone. So some of them act have actions on endocrine systems, so glucocorticoids, thyroid hormones, uh, hypogonadism-inducing agents, as already said, aromatase inhibitors, uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate, which is used as a contraceptive. I won't cover it at all. GnRH agonists in males with a prostate cancer. Then thiazolidin dions, very it's difficult it's to pronounce in English because I would say thiazolidin dioni in my Slovenian language. So. Um, these are drugs that are used to treat diabetes, and they are known to um, turn uh, the mesenchymal stem cells, not to differentiate in, for instance, muscle cells or bone-forming osteoblasts, but they uh, produce um, fat cells, so adipocytes. This is the main action of thiazolidine dions. So drugs with actions on the central nervous system, antidepressants, anticonvulsant, we have talked about it. Drugs with actions on the immune system, uh, calcineurin inhibitors, antiretroviral therapy. I think we should talk more about this because HIV infection is quite prevalent and uh, these drugs can really cause many uh, disturbances. Then heparin can cause osteoporosis. Loop diuretics, as already nicely explained by uh, the previous speaker, and proton pump inhibitors, which are used very, very widely. It's not clear what are the mechanism behind. There are some theories. There are not clear-cut guidelines because there are um, discrepant results of different studies, but we have to be aware that proton pump inhibitors can cause bone loss and can increase uh, risk for fractures. Therefore, just be aware when you treat patients. So the gl glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis is the most prevalent cause of secondary osteoporosis. 1% of the whole U.S. population takes glucocorticoids, and about 4.6 postmenopausal women take glucocorticoids. And the glucocorticoids are used to treat uh, inflammatory, chronic inflammatory diseases like asthma, COPD, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and many other. Uh, autoimmune diseases, and then as immunosuppressive um, uh, medication, also used in rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases, but also in organ transplantation, and these patients are especially prone to develop osteoporosis because of their uh, initial disease, and then because of the treatment that is introduced after the transplantation. 
with glucocorticoids and other immune suppressors. Uh, we have to keep in mind that dosage of glucocorticoids is very important to, <coughs> to, uh, to deal with. So in some diseases, we use very high dosages like giant cell arteritis, uh, vasculitis, lupus, dermatomyositis, and these treatments go for many, many months and even years. Uh, 30 to 50 percent of patients on long-term glucocorticoid therapy suffer an osteoporotic fracture. And this is what we are afraid of, and this is what we have to prevent. Uh, in glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis, the trabecular, so cancellous bone, is mostly affected, so we will see mostly fractures of vertebra and maybe proximal femur, but most of all vertebra. It's important to keep in mind that glucocorticoids use is associated with an increase in fracture risk that can begin very early. Uh, namely, these fractures can happen already in the first three to six months of after the in introducing glucocorticoid treatment. I will explain later why is this, because in that time we don't see any drop in bone mineral density. So bone mineral density is not a good indicator of fracture risk in GIOP. Then we have to keep in mind that higher dosages of prednisolone and cumulative dose of prednisolone are very important to assess risk. Uh, I don't know what you use here, but we don't use so much prednisolone. We use methylprednisolone, which is uh, equivalent. So five milligrams of prednisolone is equal to four milligrams of methylprednisolone. So keep this uh, equation in mind. So how do they work? Reduced bone formation and increased cortical porosity are key pathogenetic features in glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. And the underlying disease, so all these inflammatory diseases that I've mentioned before, are very important because they also cause bone loss and with inflammatory um, cytokines impair uh, bone formation. This is a cartoon showing us what glucocorticoids really do. First of all, they attack osteocytes. Osteocytes are very important cells in the bone. They are mechanoceptors, receptors, and they say where the bone has to be remodeled, which part of bone has been damaged, and where this bone resorption should start, which will then follow, be followed with bone formation. So remodeling, they uh, regulate remodeling, and glucocorticoids increase apoptosis of um, osteocytes, so there is less and less osteocytes, and therefore there is decreased canalicular circulation, so less blood comes to the bone, inside the bone, and therefore there is a decrease in bone quality. And this happens very fast in the first months of glucocorticoid treatment. And this makes uh, the quality of bone uh, worse, and this makes bones prone to fractures without drop in bone mineral density yet. And then glucocorticoids at the beginning, stimulate uh, bone resorption by stimulating osteoclasts, uh, by uh, there is an increased production of sclerostin that blocks bone formation, and also uh, there is increased production of frank ligand, which stimulates osteoclastogenesis. But with time, glucocorticoids uh, don't stimulate osteoclastogenesis anymore, but they prolong the life uh, time of osteoclasts. So the number of osteoclasts stays the same. It doesn't reduce, 
and osteoclast survival is therefore increased. Um, the most affected are, again, osteoclasts in the trabecular cancellous bone, so vertebra are mostly prone for uh, fractures, and bone resorption is maintained. And the most important and long-lasting negative effect of glucocorticoids is on osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are bone-forming cells, and glucocorticoids decrease osteoblastogenesis, increase apoptosis of osteoblasts, and also uh, they act specially on osteoblasts in the cancellous trabecular bone. Um, though synthetic ability is decreased and bone formation is suppressed all the time. It's important to keep in mind that in the beginning of glucocorticoid treatment, in the first year, uh, a person can lose 6 to 12 percent of bone mass, it, which is very, very high. But then later on in uh, next years, uh, the person loses about 3 percent of bone mass per year. And now the Ma a bit wider pathogenetic mechanism. I told you about osteoblasts, decreased proliferation, increased apoptosis. We have to keep in mind that glucocorticoids suppress adrenals. They suppress the pr uh, production of androgens in adrenals and in testes. And they also suppress the activity of hypothalamus at the pituitary with suppressing GnRH, pulsatility, and therefore the production of sex steroids, which really protect bone, is decreased. Lately, people say it's not, so, it's not such a very important mechanism as direct action of glucocorticoids on bone cells, but it should be kept in mind. And then we have less bone formation because of this first event, and then glucocorticoids also suppress osteoprotegerin formation by osteoblasts. Osteoprotegerin should block rank ligand, should block the substance that stimulates osteoclastogenesis, but it is not blocked because there's not enough osteoprotegerin. Then it also, glucocorticoids also uh, impact on calcium metabolism. It, they decrease absorption of gastrointestinal tract they also block vitamin D activity there, and they also decrease calcium reabsorption from the kidney, as already nicely explained earlier. So sometimes we have a secondary hyperparathyroidism, which can then secondary uh, stimulate bone resorption to keep the calcium levels in the normal range. And then again, bone resorption increases, loss of bone mass, and then increased fracture risk. We shouldn't forget that glucocorticoids also um, cause uh, muscle catabolism, so muscle weakness, and these patients fall more often because they are not so strong. Their muscles are not so strong. Now about the guidelines. There are many guidelines out there, but I chose to show you the guidelines um, published by Osteo International Osteoporosis Foundation and American National Osteoporosis Foundation, and the recent guidelines by the American College of Rheumatology. So I will make a mixture of uh, what is proposed to be done, and will try not to be too, too long with this. So the goal of osteoporosis treatment, any osteoporosis treatment, is to prevent osteoporotic fractures. Therefore, at the beginning, before the patient is put on glucocorticoids or just after he is put on, so in the first six months, a patient has to be assessed uh, about the risk for osteoporosis without glucocorticoids that the, he carries with which uh, family history and other things. So not only measurement of bone mineral density tells us about the risk, but also other things. Uh, therefore, we should use FRAX. All the guidelines agree 
that FRAX should be used, although FRAX is not the best tool to assess glucocorticoids, and I will show you why and what to do to correct this. Um, so this is the FRAX. Uh, I don't know if Greece has... Oh, yeah, you have. Excellent. We don't. And we are using UK FRAX because Europeans, we are very similar in incidence of uh, fractures. Here you can see that FRAX also takes into account the glucocorticoid treatment. It is only then when somebody in the past or in the future or now takes or is taking, will take glucocorticoids for three months continuously. It's important, three months continuously. And what is important, FRAX takes into account the dosage of prednisolone 2.5 to 7.5, so 4 to 6 milligrams of methylprednisolone. If the dosage is higher, we have to do adjustments. And let us do this, see these corrections. If the dose is more than 7.5 milligrams of prednisolone per day, we have to multiply the risk that we get out of FREX by 1.15 for multiple major, uh, um, for major osteoporotic fractures, so uh, spine, um, radius, humerus, and with 1.2 for the hip fracture. And these corrections are quite good, but not good enough for patients who take very high dosages of glucocorticoids. So then we have to have loser criteria to introduce differ differentiated treatment. And who should be treated? FRAX risk higher than 10%. So not 20% as in general osteoporosis, but the risk is intermediate or great if it is more than 20% or more than 10%. Or for the hip, we have different numbers. I chose 3%, some say 1% already. So any patient who had sustained osteoporotic fracture should get treatment. All the patients who we put on glucocorticoids are, and are older of se than 70 years should get glucocorticoids, uh, not considering any other risk factors. And in patients who get more than 7.5 milligrams for long term should also get uh, treatment for osteoporosis or prevention of osteoporotic fractures. So this is something that is general. And uh, when we look at the bone mineral density measured by DEXA, T-score at any measured place or site smaller than minus 1.5 SD, standard deviation, uh, is also indication to introduce bisphosphonates, nosmop, whatever. Uh, these are the, the main points that we should learn and keep in mind. And how should we treat patients who are put on glucocorticoids? A first-line treatment by all the guidelines is oral bisphosphonates. Alendronate, risedronate are the most powerful. Ibendronate is not so good, but if nothing else is available, then ibendronate can work. And when per, uh, per us oral bisphosphonates are not tolerated or all are not efficient, then we can go to IV bisphosphonates, zoledronic acid, 5 milligrams, per year. It's like treatment of any other osteoporosis. The dosage is the same. And if we want really to treat glucocorticoid use osteoporosis at the level which is mostly affected, so bone formation, we could stimulate bone formation by teriparatide, a sub-Q, and only in cases when all these other drugs are not uh, useful, efficacious, or available, we can use the Nosomap, the usual dosage, 60 milligrams sub-Q every six months, but 
we have to be cautious because we don't have enough data if we can give the nosomap to patients who are on immunosuppressant therapy. A raloxifene is not very efficient, but raloxifene has been shown to reduce vertebral fractures. If women, postmenopausal women, can't tolerate any other drug or drug is not available, then we can use raloxifene. And usually we should treat as long as the risk is there, assessed as I showed you, and as long the patients are taking glucocorticoids. When we stop glucocorticoids, the bone metabolism can improve and then we can stop treatment if the risk is not there anymore or if the risk is smaller. Now, if we look at the, these drugs, uh, bisphosphonates reduce or offend the uh, osteoclastogenesis and osteoclasts, so bone resorption is reduced. And they can also block partially the um, deleterious effects of glucocorticoids on osteoblasts. But this is theoretical, and it hasn't been proven yet. And teriparatide acts on bone formation, stimulates bone formation, so that when long-term glucocorticoid treatment does the most harm. Key points, early preventive anti-osteoporosis measurements based on FRAX-related intervention thresholds are recommended for patients receiving chronic glucocorticoid therapy. Lifestyle and nutritional measurements advocated for patients with GIOP are identical to those of uh, uh, primary osteoporosis, so I won't go into this. So pharmacological anti-resorptive Anti-osteoporotic therapy could be stopped upon withdrawal of glucocorticoids unless the patient remains at increased risk of fracture. Conclusion, glucocorticoid therapy is a common cause of osteoporosis but remains under-recognized and under-treated. Only half of the women that should get treatment when glucocorticoids are induced, introduced so in the first year or in the first six months, only half of them get treatment now, and only 10% of men who should get treatment get treatment. Very bad. So direct effects of glucocorticoids on bone include an early transient increase in bone resorption and long-term suppression of bone formation. Rapid bone loss, 6 to 12%, and increased fracture risk occur early and in the course of glucocorticoid therapy, uh, emphasizing the importance of primary prevention in those at high risk of fractures. And we should use FRAX. We should adapt FRAX to the dosage of glucocorticoid. Uh, we should multiply, as I told you, with 115 for major and 120 for, for hip fractures. And the first-line treatment is bisphosphonates, in all patients who can tolerate them. Now, the next part of my talk will be on aromatase inhibitors in patients with breast cancer. We call the loss, bone loss, that is induced with cancer therapy, uh, like cancer therapy induced bone loss, CTIBL, stible. And I might use this uh, shortage, this acronym, later on. Um, estrogen deprivation uh, in postmenopausal women can be achieved with aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifene. And this is the principle of treatment, of adjuvant treatment after the, the tumor has been removed and after uh, the woman has be the radiotherapy or whatever was indicated, maybe also chemotherapy. The Adjuvant therapy lasts for 5 to 10 years, so aromatase inhibitors will act very long. And how does it work? In postmenopausal women, the estrogen levels are rather low, but they are formed from uh, androgens, mostly androgens that are synthesized in the adrenals. And then we still have 
uh, estrogens. In uh, more obese ladies, there are more androgens than in thin ladies, ladies because uh, obese ladies have more aromatase in their fat tissue. So if we block transformation of androgens into estrogens with aromatase inhibitors, we've done a good work. Another possibility is to block estrogen receptors um, with estrogens, uh, specific estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen, which is also efficient. Tamoxifen can uh, prevent bone loss while aromatase inhibitors induce bone loss. These are aromatase inhibitors that are used, letrozole, anastrozole, and exemestan. And here is the bone loss in real life in physiological conditions, men, postmenopausal women in the later menopause or climacterium, menopausal women in the first years of menopause, <coughs> and then menopausal women that are put on aromatase inhibitors, this bone loss is higher, maybe even higher than 2.6%. I've seen numbers much higher in other studies. Then androgen deprivation treatment that I will talk later on, the bone loss is very high, nearly 5% per year. So keep in mind when you treat patients with uh, uh, prostate cancer and teach urologists, teach oncologists to take care about bone because too many persons are not getting a proper treatment. If we induce... Um, menopause chemically with GnRH agonists or antagonists and, and add aromatase inhibitors, bone loss is very, very high. And this happens in young women who will uh, supposedly survive for a long time if we succeed to treat their cancer. And in uh, menopause that is induced by chemotherapy, which happens quite often, it chemotherapy is severe, the bone loss is also very high, 7.7% per year. And very importantly, we talked about bone loss with glucocorticoids in the trabecular bone. Here, the most uh, deleterious things happen in the Cortical bone. Cortical bone composes 80% of our bones and is the one that makes our bones strong. So what happens with aromatase inhibitors or with, with reduction in estrogens? There is a huge bone loss in cortical bone volume as measured uh, in, with uh, higher resolution uh, QCT and it is much greater than shown by DEXA scan. This was in a, a study in healthy postmenopausal women who had very high risk to develop cancer, breast cancer. They, they hadn't have a cancer yet. And now what has been shown recently in the Lancet paper, uh, it is a multicenter study uh, on a quite a high number of patients, uh, they, they were treated with aromatase inhibitors, all of them, half of them receiving additionally placebo and half of them receiving the nosumab. So the, in the placebo group that was on aromatase inhibitors, the, bone, the fracture incidence was as high as 10% after three years of treatment with aromatase inhibitors, 16% at five years, and 26% at seven years on aromatase inhibitors. As compared in the nosomap group, where I will show you later how it looks like. So what is the goal? This is the guidelines that are mostly used. I chose those uh, to, to prevent uh, bone loss and fractures. We have to assess all women that start on uh, aromatase inhibitors. We have to measure bone mineral density as soon as possible. And we have to assess clinical risk factors with FREX. And then we should measure calcium, vitamin D, PTH, 
maybe bone turnover markers, but it's not necessary, just to exclude secondary, other secondary causes of osteoporosis and introduce preventative measures to reduce fracture risk. What are general measures? Physical activity should be stimulated in upright positions so the uh, body weight can activate bone remodeling. Then vitamin D. Some studies suggest as high as 10,000 units, but we say optimal is 2,000 units. There were some studies showing that women who had higher vitamin D levels when they developed uh, breast cancer did much better than those that had lower vitamin D levels at the beginning of the disease. And calcium, at least 1,000 milligrams or 1 gram or 1,200 milligrams. Uh, the guidelines are uh, different. So uh, who should be treated with anti-resorptive treatment? Keep in mind that all the patients that get cancer can't be treated with anabolics because we can increase uh, the danger of metastases in the bone. So only antiresorptive should be used, and they have also additional beneficial effects. Some studies showing that they develop less metastases in the bone if they get antiresorptive treatment. But the main thing here is to prevent osteoporotic fractures. So if the T-score is minus 2.5 or less, or if the woman has sustained osteoporotic fracture already, the other criterion, T-score minus 1.5 and one or more clinical risk factors, or T-score minus 1.0 and two or more clinical risk factors, or for hip fracture, more than 3% by FRAX. And all women older than 70 years, some say 70, some say 75, I would rather say 70 years, should get with aromatase inhibitors also uh, differential treatment. And who are other uh, candidates? Also, young women can be given antiresorptive treatment uh, if they are put on GnRH agonists, so to, to do chemical menopause, and they, the threshold is even lower here, T-score minus 1.0, or, of course, osteoporotic fracture. So what do we give them? I prefer zoledronic acid every six months because the studies were done with these dosages, uh, and um, the uh, Adherence is better because women don't adhere to oral bisphosphonates so well. It's known that 30% of women only uh, take bisphosphonates after one year of treatment. The nosumab is also very good and resorptive. It's given as in osteoporosis, any other kind of osteoporosis, 60 milligrams sub-Q every six months. And oral bisphosphonates can be given also if the patient is adherent. Duration of therapy should be assessed individually, but should last at least for three years if we decided to introduce the treatment. And then uh, we can stop it, of course, when aromatase inhibitors are stopped because the uh, risk is diminished. And now I want to show you this study on 3,420 women that I already showed you about the incidence of fractures, that as compared uh, to women who were on aromatase inhibitors and, uh, and uh, the nosumab, the fracture incidence was increased as high as 26% after seven years uh, without the nosumab. And then this adenosumab um, is beneficial uh, through, through consequence of aromatase inhibitors or bone strength were underestimated in previous oncologic studies because fractures were not the primary endpoint of the studies. It was just the second endpoint sometimes. 
and aduvendinosumab benefits are similar in patients with normal bone mineral density in this study, as well as in low bone mineral density, and important side effect with adjuvant denosumab or bisphosphonate in other studies, better disease-free and bone metastasis-free and overall survivor was observed in these women. So we should be loose in deciding to give antiresorptives to, to women that are. And few slides on androgen deprivation treatment in prostate cancer. Here again, most of the prostate cancer cells have androgen receptors, and if we block uh, um, androgen receptors is one way of treatment, and the better way of treatment is to decrease production of testosterone and dehydrotestosterone by uh, giving GnRH analogs. And this is called androgen deprivation therapy. And men who really have a, a high level, um, high malignant uh, prostate cancer should get this treatment. Uh, what are the other possibilities? Surgical castration, or hydectomy, GnRH agonists and antagonists, or combination of GnRH agonists and antiandrogens. So it is complete androgen blockade, CAB. Uh, if we only give androgen receptor antagonists, this is not so deleterious to bone as by stopping production of testosterone uh, completely. And here we can see what happens. Osteoporosis, bone loss, I've shown you, 5% per year. And then also metabolic consequences, sarcopenia, insulin resistance, diabetes, and so on. But uh, it's how bone loss is, uh, um, happens and how the risk fracture increases with the number of dosages of GnRH agonists is shown on this slide. And orchidectomy, so total remov removal of uh, uh, testosterone, has the most deleterious effect on uh, incidence of fractures. Here, uh, also, survival or mortality is higher in patients uh, who had uh, uh, GnRH agonistic treatment, and those who sustained the fracture, survival is less than in those who haven't sustained the fracture during the uh, tr and, uh, treatment of... Uh, Maria, please, two minutes. One minute I need. Very good. Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the guidelines uh, were published in 2014 by urologists. The same uh, uh, is true for men as for women on aromatase inhibitors, physical activity, calcium, vitamin D, avoid all other uh, risk factors like drinking, smoking, and so on. And then evaluate bone mineral density by DEXA, use FRAX tool, and then Early treatment is recommended when we see the osteoporosis, so enough if T-score is minus 2.5 or enough if T-score is minus, two, uh, minus 1 and other risk factors present. And here is the effect of bisphosphonates. We can see that with placebo, uh, patients lose bone mineral density, and with zoledronate, 4 milligrams, for a year, for three months, or oral, oral bisphosphonates, they gain uh, bone mineral density, so it's beneficial. And also with the nosomab, they su succeeded to show that fracture risk was reduced in patients who are denosom on denosomab as compared to patients who are placebo during they were given androgen deprivation treatment. So what is in real life? I will just rush through it. It's very high number of patients who were on anti and, uh, uh, androgen deprivation treatment. They already had osteoporosis beforehand, and they had uh, uh, fractures beforehand. And this is very important. 
only few percent of patients were given anti-osteoporotic treatment during androgen deprivation treatment. It's like 5%, it's like 2%, and this is not enough, really. And we should make our colleagues, urologists and oncologists, aware of fractures, fracture risk. So to sum up, uh, androgen deprivation treatment uh, can last for many years for prostate cancer, and this can increase the risk of fractures. We should assess DEXA, we should uh, assess risk factors, make a good history, and we should treat our patients with vitamin D and anti-resorptive treatment like bisphosphonates, IV, per oral bisphosphonates, or the nosomap. So thank you very much.